I do think that thinking about death and talking about death with ourselves, with our loved ones, is it takes a huge weight off of our shoulders and it may be a weight that we didn't even know we were carrying. Well, hello, one and all, and welcome to Farewelling, the podcast, a delightful place where we explore a happier ending to our human experience. I'm Karen Bussin, and today I'm joined by an amazing and clever guest. But before we get started, I wanted to tell you about a little tool we've created to help you get started thinking about what you might want for your own farewelling. We call it our farewelling checklist, and you can check it out at myfarewelling.com. So today I'm here with my friend and farewelling friend too, Grace Lynn. She's a licensed mental health counselor, so you know she's official, and she has a private practice that specializes in cognitive behavior therapy for kids and adults. Also, Grace wants you to know that she's not Grace Lynn, the children's book author, which of course, being a childless woman myself, I, would, <laughs> I wouldn't know who that Grace Lynn is. You're my Grace Lynn, so hi, Grace. Hi, thank you so much for having me today. I think a good place to start is, why are we Americans so freaked out about death? Other cultures around the world are at least somewhat more open to it, right? Look at the Swedes, for example, for God's sake. They do this thing called, I'm going to try to pronounce the Swedish word. I'm sorry, Swedish people out there. Dostadning. Dostadning, which is also known as death cleaning, where actually they clean up their own stuff before they die. So their families don't have to do it for them, and they give their stuff away. And in doing this, they're basically like accepting the fact that they're going to go. So they're wrapping up nicely. And they seem pretty cool with it. There are some cultures that purposely unbury the dead on occasion to revisit with them, right? Okay. So the spectrum is wide. Everything from what we experience here in the United States to people who revisit the dead and buried many years after the fact, right? Wow. And I think in terms of the United States, I would just start by saying things weren't always this way. I do think there are a couple of factors in particular that are contributing to our obsessive avoidance of thinking about death and dying. And I think one of the first things that I would point to is that if you look back a couple of hundred years ago, even in the United States, births, sickness, illness, caring, dying was all largely done in the home. You were cared for by your family. Graves were dug by the community, right? Mm -hmm. And it was a collective mourning experience. It was a very hands-on, tangible process. And it was also very, very unpredictable. You know, mm -hmm. children died in childbirth. Mothers died in childbirth. Illnesses and disease struck at any moment. There were no vaccines. There was no predictability or even explanation around it. So people were actually dying more often. Mm. And when they died, people were participating in the caring and the burying and the celebrating and the rituals, you know, and yeah. not just your own intimate family, but really on a broader scale in terms of the community. So what do you think happened? So hospitals. Mm. So what ended up happening is at some point, hospitals, which used to be really reserved for the poor and the infirm and were really run by religious organizations, all of a sudden started to become more mainstream. They were sterile places. They housed experts and doctors and nurses who had degrees. And so then all of a sudden, if you think about it, all that hands-on care, all the contact, all the language that we have for the process of death and dying, the exposure, the experience, the relationship is now all behind closed doors. It's like we don't have that anymore. We so. don't have it. We don't have it. I mean, we visit, don't get me wrong. We love our loved ones and our friends and we visit and we try and do what we can, but we are largely so much more separated than we ever were before. Yeah, you know? and sort of in that separation, it makes us feel super awkward about the whole thing because we, we like don't language. have that language, right? Exactly. You, you know, you don't Can't even know speak what, it. what to do. Right? Exactly. So, so clearly we have some issues. Uh, we do. There. We do. And I think what may have compounded that was our or this country's similar obsession with feeling good. Mm. You know, we just want to feel 
positive and happy and fulfilled <laughs> and pleasant and awesome. And if you put something uncomfortable in front of my face, I'm going to try and smack it away as fast as I can. Mm. I, I deal with that all the time. People come in and they're like, I don't feel good. Can you make this go away? And I'm thinking like, that's just called being human. You were sad because you should be sad. Mm. You were scared because you should be scared. Like these are normal emotions and we don't even want to feel them anymore, right? So not only dying and death, but like poverty and disability. Like we are just fabulous in this country at sort of shoving that in the little corner so we don't really have to look at it too closely because it's uncomfortable and we don't want to be uncomfortable. Yeah, yeah, wow. We're on a mission to kind of change all that, right? Because for us, we feel like it's a part of our shared human experience. Why is it so good to think about our own death? And what's in it for us if we do go through the effort of thinking about it? Excellent question. I do think that being more proactive about thinking about your death and planning for your death offers so many amazing benefits. And I think the first one is it really changes the way that we approach our day-to-day living. It really helps us focus on what's really most important to us so that we don't get bogged down in details that we objectively know we really don't care about. You mean like when your boss is mansplaining stuff to you or something? When your boss is (laughs) mansplaining stuff to you, when somebody has snagged that perfect front row seat at your fourth grader spring musical and you're annoyed, (laughs) right? It really helps us focus, you know, on a broader scale, but also like in the moment. It It has the ability to really crystallize, hey, is this really worth my time right now? And so it can affect everything from our mood It can affect the decisions we make, right? Because if we really are more focused, then we've got a better chance of making choices that are in line with what we really think we Mm. want in life. So like it could theoretically help you live your values more. Yes. Mm -hmm. Job choices, living situations, dating, you know, relationships on the topic of relationships. Wait, how can my thinking about death affect my dating life? (laughs) That is definitely a separate podcast. So let's get to that another time. Oh, (laughs) that's a big one. Look out for that one. But in terms of relationships, it can certainly influence you know, who you spend your time with and maybe more importantly, who you don't spend your time with, you know, and also just make your lived day to day experience more. More vibrant, deeper, deeper. right, deeper, not beyond more meaningful. It's just you're participating more. Maybe that's what I'm trying to say, as opposed to just living through it. Living in the present is just so difficult for us these days. So that's kind of like the big first benefit. The second benefit that's really worth noting is really the the gift, right, that you offer to your loved ones and letting them know exactly what you want to happen when you do die. Because we are going to die. Like, Mm -hmm. this is inevitable. All right. right? Take it easy. (laughs) (laughs) It's going to happen. It's going to happen to us. It's going to happen to them uh, so that they're not left wondering and guessing what is it that you would have wanted, right? Or have family members actually argue about that. All that means is just thinking about it writing it down and sharing it with somebody. It doesn't even have to be like a legal document. But doesn't. Yeah. You want more? Yeah, Another you got benefit? More? I got Why not? Yeah. Go for it. <laughs> I do think that thinking about death and talking about death with ourselves, with our loved ones, is it takes a huge weight off of our shoulders and it may be a weight that we didn't even know we were carrying. In some cases, it's kind of like taking a little bit of control over the inevitable. Yeah, it's. I like to say it's like you are exercising some control over what you can control because you certainly can't control everything. Exactly. But the things that you can, it really does give you that feeling of empowerment. It does. Um, which I think is a word people throw around too much, but it, it does give you that sense of, you know, agency and even more confidence. Right. And I think, you know, the extension of that is then having the conversation with your loved ones, you know, so that at the end of the day, you don't have to avoid the thoughts. You don't have to avoid the conversations or avoid the conversations that lead to the conversations. Right. So they will feel better Mm -hmm. and you will feel amazing because Mm -hmm. you made them feel better. And to compare the feeling, you will likely feel even better than you feel when you organize your home office, renew your car registration, write a blog post and do your laundry all in one day. Yep. And then you will take yourself out for a hot fudge sundae or in my case, an entire bottle of rosé and probably some french fries. Why? because you just did something real hard and you deserve a treat.
let's dive into like the real center of it. Let's say that we all agree that thinking about the finite nature of our go round on this crazy planet is actually a good thing. So what are some strategies for all of us to use in thinking about our own mortality and what we want for our farewelling? I don't think it's that complicated. I think coming up with a little phrase that really means something to you that highlights the time-limited nature yeah. of all of our presence in oh, this God, earthly like, form. What is, right? that, helps. what is that phrase no, going to so be? No, so the phrase know. might just be something like, look, I don't have forever. Oh, I like that. I don't have forever, right? So you're in the parking lot. Somebody just snagged your spot. I don't have forever. It's almost like a little mantra. Like and a little mantra. it could be mantra. a personal mantra. Exactly. Or it could be like, today is a gift. Yeah, it doesn't have to be complicated. Yeah, and right? it doesn't have to be like, Karen, you're going to die. Right, exactly. <laughs> And also what ends up happening is it's like a habit. If you become more conscious of it and you talk about it to yourself in this way, yeah. you know, gradually it gets a little bit more ingrained in the fabric of how you think, yeah. you know, and then you may not feel the need to actually verbalize it as much, you know? Yes. And I think, I don't know if this directly answers the question, but when we're then trying to figure out, okay, what is most important to me? Like when we talk about thinking about our death as being this amazing thing that can transform our lives, sometimes People have a hard time, you know, figuring out, okay, well, then how do I figure out what's most important? You know, yeah. there's a lot of different ways that people go about it. Usually the question that people get asked is, like, if you were told that you had a week left to live, yeah, what would you do with your time? Right. You and know? that's kind of what you should be doing. Kind of. And then I get it, right? You can't just drop everything and fly to Tahiti with all of your best friends and oh. live out the next five days. But I guess what I just want to point out is I still feel like that exercise is useful mm -hmm. because if you spend the time, which I'm not going to ask you to do now, but I'm just saying theoretically spend the time to think about it. If I change that question from a week to a month to a year to five years, your answer is not going to change that much, mm -hmm. except for maybe the practicality of having to earn some money to pay some bills. Yeah. Right. You're still going to now be more confronted with, again, the time limited nature. And we all know that time flies by faster than we ever realized. But that's also what people who are dying say. Yeah. Like, it flew by so fast. Where did it know? all go? And then how about, let's say that you're thinking about how this affects how you live, mm -hmm. which I think is so important. Mm -hmm. But then also, how do you get yourself to that mental place where you're okay with thinking about the things that you actually want done, mm -hmm. like for when you are gone? I actually think the idea of the fear rolling checklist is really helpful. Yeah. Because sometimes we just don't even know where to start. Yeah. You know? And sometimes we can't take on all that much at once. We right. need to do it in bite-sized pieces, exactly. right? So having something kind of outline, these are the things that you might want to consider in terms of the logistics, yeah. in terms of the finances, in terms of the healthcare planning, yeah. right? Yeah, everyone thinks of planning for their own death as something that is like, it's, I mean, it's going to take a while because you got to make some decisions and you got to, you know, right. get it all down on paper. But if you do just break it up, even like one question a week or, yes. you know, or an hour that you spend answering a few questions or even just thinking about it and, you know, getting some general notes down. So that's why we've made the farewelling file checklist so that people can, you know, at least have a little guidance in a friendly voice yeah. to help kind of walk them through that. Yeah. Yeah. And I think it's really valuable because I think the other thing to consider is that there's this anticipation that it's going to be so uncomfortable. That's really hard to get over, right? And so when we have something like, a, like an easy way, clearly outlined way to just get started. Yeah, exactly. Then we get the evidence that like, oh, it's not actually as bad as I thought it was going to be. Yeah, and that's the way we've structured the farewelling file checklist. So you kind of start with like a bigger picture of what's most important to you and then you work your way exactly. into those details and you take it as slow as you want. Exactly, at your own pace, you know, right? Yeah. That's exactly right. Okay, Grace Lynn, this has been wonderful. 
thank you so much for helping us to do something really hard, but I think we both agree totally worthwhile. Folks, if you want to start your own farewelling file, or even if you want to read more about Swedish death cleaning <laughs> or dostadning, I'm sorry again, well, please do come on over to the site at myfarewelling.com. And we'd also love it if you join us on social media at myfarewelling on Instagram or visit the Farewelling Facebook page. And we'll also have some more information for folks and some articles that you've written on all kinds of topics. So we're aiming to build a community, everyone, and we hope you'll be a part of it. So thanks again, Grace. Thanks, Karen. That's our mini-sode for today. Wishing each and every one of our farewellers out there a beautiful day. And remember, you got a whole lot of living to do. We'll see you next time. <laughs>